So I'm now on Battlefield 5 and I'm going to talk about the responsiveness of the monitor. So I've got the monitor running at 165Hz, the game's running at a good solid 165 frames a second. So I'm pushing things well here. This is a 165Hz monitor, although it does have a 180Hz overclock option. I'm not really going to use that and it doesn't really matter if I did use it, you wouldn't be able to see the difference on the video anyway. But this does give a little bit of an edge, and I do talk about this in the written review. But as I say there, um, and, and actually show you there, it's a slight difference. The other thing to be aware of that is the overclock feature isn't guaranteed to work. It does depend on your GPU, and it also locks off VRR support, variable refresh rate, which most people like to use on monitors like this. If you want to squeeze every last ounce out of the monitor in terms of its refresh rate capabilities, then yes, you can use that overclock setting. It's there for you to use. But most people really are probably going to want to use VRR and just stick to 165 hertz maximum. Don't feel too hard done by. There's really not a huge difference between 165 and 180 frames a second and hertz. So with that said, yes, there is a significant difference here between 60 hertz and 165 hertz. So the monitor is pumping out up to 2.75 times as much visual information every second as a 60 hertz monitor, or this monitor running at 60 hertz, 60 frames a second. So this brings two main advantages. One is that it improves the connected feel that describes the fluidity, the precision you feel when you're interacting with the game. It's also important to have low input lag to really aid that connected feel, and this monitor does. It has exceptionally low input lag. I measured just under two milliseconds in this case, so that indicates an exceptionally low signal delay, which is the main element of input lag you feel. So even for sensitive users, this is going to be great, absolutely fine. The other advantage of the high frame rate, high refresh rate combination, it decreases the perceived blur due to eye movement. This is something which is explored in some detail in an article on the website and also summarised in the responsiveness section of the written review. So do check that out if you're interested or you're not familiar with the term perceived blur. And it also explores pursuit photography, a photography technique which can be used to capture the motion on the monitor in a way which encompasses this perceived blur due to eye movement but also the pixel responses of the monitor. That's very important as well to consider. The pixel responses of the monitor, they do influence the perceived blur as well. So you can see pursuit photographs here. The monitor is running at 165 hertz. Various different refresh rates are shown in the written review if you're interested in some comparisons there and how it performs at various different refresh rates. But it has three different response time settings, standard, advanced and ultra fast. I consider advanced to be optimal. It's the best tuned. Ultrafast has too much overshoot. You can see this colourful trailing behind the UFO. And in practice, that is very eye-catching across a broad range of transitions, so I don't find the ultrafast mode useful. Advanced, on the other hand, there's really very little to speak of in the way of overshoot, but it does give you a bit of an edge in pixel responses coming from standard. And I've also got a reference screen there, the Gigabyte M27Q. It's running at 170 hertz, but that's a negligible difference versus 165 hertz, so it can be used as a valid comparison here. And the reason I like to use that is that the M27Q, it's the revision one I tested, by the way, if you're interested, the M27Q, that's at a level which most people are very comfortable with in terms of its pixel responses. So if a monitor can at least match that, then that's a good start. If it can beat it, then that's even better. And this ViewSonic does beat it. It has a less bold initial trail just behind the UFO. We can see for the medium background, that's the middle row, and also the dark background, the top row. And also actually for the light background bottom row, for that matter, if you look closely enough, just less of an initial trail behind the red UFO body in particular, and just less of a powdery trail behind the yellow UFO cockpit as well. So what that means is the ViewSonic here performing pretty well in terms of its pixel responses. So that really just translates onto a broader range of pixel transitions. So they're mainly light to medium shades here, but there are some darker shades mixed in. There aren't really any standout weaknesses, any obvious weaknesses. Certainly nothing I'd describe as a smeary trail like you get on VA models typically, or a heavy powdery trail, which you might get on some IPS models, some slower IPS models. The slowest pixel transition, so an example of that would be bright or highly saturated shades against a darker background, so where it has open range here and the icon there, you're not really going to be able to see this on the video, but there's just a bit of that powdery trailing. And you can just see it more broadly where there are little intricate mixtures of shades, so the little shadow details on the rocks there with brighter shades in the background. Just a little bit of extra perceived blur, but again, nothing that will really stand out and most people will find obnoxious or anything like that, so nothing really to complain about. Also. 
Speaking of not much to complain about in the way of overshoot either, it's just um, it's sort of little traces here and there, but nothing that stands out in an obvious way. Even if you're sensitive to overshoot at 165 hertz, even using the advanced setting, I really don't think most people are going to actually notice this, even if you're actively looking for it. So it isn't something I'd worry about. I'm on another scene on Battlefield 5, and this scene has a different range of transitions, really. It's got more dark shades mixed in. But it has some quite high contrast transitions, so there are some isolated bright shades with much darker backgrounds. So these reveal some of the, again, the, the weaker transitions. But when I say weaker, I don't mean they're weak, they're just somewhat slower than optimal. So it's a little bit of the powdery trailing again in places, but nothing really eye-catching or bothersome. And I'd say the same about overshoot, again, just traces in places, like around the tree there, for example, just a little bit. But I do stress a little bit, most people aren't really going to notice this at all. So overall, really pretty competent 165Hz performance here. Nothing that really warrants much complaint. It's definitely a performance which most people are going to be very happy with. The monster also supports variable refresh rate, VRR technologies, you can use adaptive sync. And that means you can use AMD FreeSync as an AMD GPU user or with a compatible games console such as the Xbox Series X. Or you can use NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode with a compatible NVIDIA GPU. That's what I'm using at the moment. I've got an RTX 3090 hooked up. The monster has a VRR range of 48 to 165 hertz, so that's what's claimed. But in practice, I found it more to be like 55 to 165 hertz. So what that means is the monitor will run its refresh rate matching the frame rate between 55 and 165 frames a second or hertz. And that gets rid of tearing and stuttering from frame and refresh rate mismatches, which you'd have without the technology enabled. And when it goes below 55 hertz, which is the floor of operation or claimed 48 hertz, so say the frame rate was 30 frames a second, the monitor could stick to 60 hertz. It uses LFC, low frame rate compensation. So it sticks to a multiple of the frame rate with its refresh rate, and that also keeps tearing and stuttering at bay. As usual, when the LFC boundary is crossed in either direction, there is a subtle momentary stuttering. Not everyone's actually going to notice this. It's pretty subtle. It's not like the kind of stuttering you get just normally without VRR. But it is there, and if you're constantly crossing the boundary and you're sensitive to this, it could be a little bit annoying. But if you're not frequently passing that boundary, it's really not something I would worry about. The other thing to be aware of is that as you have a decrease in frame rate, and to demonstrate that, I've got the game running at 120 frames a second and the monitor is running at 120 hertz to match. There is a decrease in connected feel, an increase in perceived blur just due to the frame rate decrease. That's not something which our technologies can compensate for. There is still a decrease in frame rate. But sometimes with VRR technologies, I'll go down to 120 hertz even, and I'll start noticing some pretty obnoxious overshoot. In this case, this, there is a little bit of an increase in the overshoot, but it's not too bad, actually. I'd still stick with the advanced setting here, because the overshoot isn't really too bad. If you are sensitive to overshoot, you're noticing some, then you could use the standard setting. It's not terrible. The pixel responses are pretty okay, actually, with the standard setting as well, particularly for 120 hertz and below. But you do get a bit of an edge with the advanced setting, and I just find the overshoot levels all right. So I've now reduced the frame rate to 80 frames a second, and the overshoot's a bit more noticeable now. You can see it around the flag, or I can see it around the flag and the tree there, but it's still fairly well blended, actually. It's not extreme overshoot. And the same now down to 60 hertz, 60 frames a second. Again, a bit more of an increase in the overshoot. It persists longer on the screen, that's really what it is, so you might notice it a little bit more. However, it's not extreme overshoot again. I think most people will probably be happy enough actually to use advanced, but if you are sensitive to this overshoot, then you could switch to standard. So you could consider this to be a single overdrive mode experience if you're one of the people who will be happy to just use advanced all the time because there's not an extreme amount of overshoot regardless. So that's actually quite good to see, particularly on a budget monitor like this. And by the way, I am sorry about the weird little interlace patterns you can see at times. That's just more from the camera. I switch over to the standard setting for response time, and I can see a little bit of an increase in that powdery trailing. But to be honest, at 60 hertz here, it's actually a pretty competent performance using the standard setting. And there's really no overshoot at all to speak of now. Remember, it's 60 hertz. I'm running at 60 frames a second at the moment. So if you are sensitive to overshoot, then feel free to use that standard setting. You might prefer it, but for others, I think just sticking to advanced throughout the variable refresh rate range will be an option.
just a few additional things to bear in mind with this monitor. You can use HDR at the same time as Adaptive Sync, and you can do that with AMD FreeSync or NVIDIA's DeSync compatible mode. That works fine. Remember that you can't use the 180Hz overclock with VRR. The monitor also has an alternative to VRR called MPRT, which uses the strobe backlight setting, and I explore that in the written review. But as demonstrated there, it is not well calibrated. There's a lot of strobe crosstalk, so even if you like strobe backlight settings, the one on this monitor is not very well tuned at all. And I don't really find it comfortable to use, and I don't find it really achieves its main goal of reducing perceived blur due to eye movement because of the fact that there's so much strobe crosstalk basically a duplication of the image centrally. It's quite a lot of central strobe crosstalk. So I don't find it a useful setting, but I don't want that to take away from the overall good performance the monitor shows at up to 165 hertz and just with VRR in general.